member of the board of directors. Uh, it's more fun being a volunteer than being board of directors. Uh, so you are here in this uh, the WWW Deputy Wagon Pavilion, which contains uh, some of the most spectacular uh, remaining uh, circus wagons in the world. Uh, we have probably 60 to 65 percent of the uh, surviving uh, parade wagons. This collection is, and, and all the property that you see is um, owned by the Wisconsin Historical Society, and uh, we are a private foundation that manages the site for the Wisconsin Historical Society. Just to, you know, because sometimes I refer to the society and sometimes the foundation, they're two different organizations. We've been in, in charge and responsible for the care of this collection for more than 50 years. And um, so I'm, it's my pleasure to take you through, um, not only talking about the wagon, but to give you a perspective as to where you are and what this is. Uh, this property is the winter quarters of the Raymond Brothers Circus from the 1880s uh, until 1918. And so what, what happened every fall is the circus, the Raymond Brothers Circus, would, uh, which started here in Baraboo, Wisconsin in 1884, uh, and, and again, remained here as the Raymond Brothers Circus until 1918. Uh, and every fall, they would come back here with the circus after it had been out touring and re for the next season, so they came back here. Across the river, uh, you, after you enter the, the new building there, the next the building next to it was the Camel Barn, and the building next to that uh, is the Rain Barn. That's where they basically practice doing bareback riding and so forth. Uh, there's a space in that lower section, uh, what I call the Riverside section, where um, a 42-foot ring, all surface rings are 42 feet across uh, to get to accommodate the gait of the horse that comes back and will end up in the same place. Uh, and then the next barn happens to be the elephant barn. Uh, the rings were in business for only two years. And by 1886, they had their first two elephants. And by 19, well, probably sometime in the 19, 1890, they had a herd of 30 elephants. And they all lived in that building in the wintertime. There is no heat in the building. The elephants generate enough heat themselves to keep the building at about 55 degrees, no matter how cold it is here in Wisconsin. And I know it gets colder than 55 degrees. Um, so, uh, the next two buildings, one was for the meat eaters, lions and tigers. The next one uh, was for uh, other hay-eating animals, such as zebras and giraffes. And um, then there's one building that is not historic, but it is it's very special to us. It holds a collection of all of the uh, costumes we use and were made here. Uh, set forward a little bit, I think. Right here in the back. Uh, all the costumes that were used in the Great Circus Parade. Anyone ever see the Great Circus Parade in Milwaukee? Okay, good, yes. Uh, for many, many years, uh, from the 1964 to 1972, these wagons were uh, transported to Milwaukee for old Milwaukee days, sponsored by Schlitz, and then starting again in 1985 until um, basically 2003, uh, there were, we would we would put all these wagons or 50 of them about on our 50, on our 28 car circus train that lives in a barn about a mile away from here. It's not open to the public, but it's a, it happens to be a historic building in and of itself, built in 1910, and it's 600 feet long. And it's uh, the longest existing wooden structure of its kind in the United States. Uh, so that's where they, you know, they kept their train, and we kept we kept the Great Circus Parade train there. Uh, and then the final building is where they kept the winter baggage stock. Let me explain this. Obviously, you know, there were no tractors and no cars. So the only way to move these beautiful things around uh, was with horses. And so in the winter time, when they came back here to winter, the, the stock that was used just to move the wagons around uh, on this site stayed in the barn down there. Across the street, which is not one of our buildings, but it's still a National Historic Registry building, was their the costume shop, the tent shop, the wagon repair shop, uh, wardrobe, and and that. So the building across the street is, was also part of the winter quarters at that time. 
Now, what is, what's significant, uh, and we talk, I'm going to talk to you about the Ringling Brothers Circus and Barnum and Bailey Circus because they were separate, highly competitive circuses in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, Barnum and Bailey had started their circus earlier. This wagon right here, number 89. Uh, is from the Barnum and Bailey Hutchison show. It was this wagon was constructed in 1880. Um, and uh, by the way, anyone see the movie Water for Elephants? Okay. Do you remember when he was feeding the lion that had no teeth? Here is the door that he fed. We had 15 of our wagons in that movie. Uh, most of them were not, this, like for example, this one was not changed at all. There are some that have Benzini Brothers painted on the side because that was the name of the fictitious circle in the, in the book, Water for Elephants. And they have, they're, we're slowly returning them to the way they should look, but this one wasn't altered. Uh, all right. The, you, we see a cage wagon. That's one kind. You see some parade wagons around here. That's another kind. But most circuses had the most well, wagons they had were baggage wagons. And we'll, you'll see a couple of examples. But understand that for uh, 10 to 20 percent looked like this, and the other 80 percent looked very plain box of wagons. And they carried everything with them because you couldn't buy it on the road. They had to take it with them. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Now, what about the circus parade? What about these wagons? The circus parade was the third and final form of advertising of the circus. The first form was a group of men called the advance team would arrive in a community about six weeks before and plaster signs all over the barns and buildings uh, announcing that the circus was coming to town. And uh, basically there was a lot of... Uh, you know, they were basically would give the bar the farmers and the merchants with big flat walls tickets. There was another group that came about three weeks before, another advance team that laid out the lot, ordered meat, hay, bread, eggs for hundreds of people that were on the circus. Because as you would imagine, there was no refrigeration, so everything had to be bought fresh. Um, and, and, and as well as hay for the animals as, as well. But the final form of advertising for the circus was the Daily Street Parade. The Daily Street Parade basically happened at 11 o'clock in the morning. And what they would do, after the tents were set up, they were ready for the show, they would basically hook the, the, the baggage stock, the stock that had unloaded the wagons from the train and, and so forth. And by the way, that's when the circus was really going strong. It's when the railroad was really going strong. And the, the, those two businesses, well, the circus business really grew significantly as the railroads expanded around the United States. Because all these wagons could be rolled up on top, and secured and taken, and it was a, an interesting system. You see, well, not you can't see it right now, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that whole train situation a little bit later in the tour. Now, I said we're going to talk about Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Barnum and Bailey is about you know, 15 years older, started in the 1870s, and was by far the preeminent circus in America. But there were lots of other circuses. We, you know, we focus on Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey in this tour. But there was Adams Fourpaw and Sells Floto, and you could go on. There were 30 or 40 uh, circuses. They were the main form of entertainment, other than the Wild West show that would come to a community in a year's time. Because of course there was no radio, no television, no movies. Uh, this was the color, really, that would come into your town uh, when it was a very drab life that you basically were leading about that time. But anyway, so at 11 o'clock in the morning, they would hook uh, the horses up to these beautiful parade wagons. And so in uh, this was, again, very great rivalry between Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. For reasons uh, that of his own knowing, um, James Bailey, who was by 1895 the only surviving partner, P.T. Barnum had by, died some years earlier, he decided to take his circus to Europe. Uh, he took the Barnum and Bailey Circus to Europe. It was highly financially successful for him, um, and he stayed for five years. However, 
in those five years, the Ringing Brothers really, they, they got very strong and became uh, the, the leading uh, circus. Barnum and Bailey had left, I mean, Bailey had left behind another big circus called the Adams Fourpaw Circus to compete with the Rings, but they didn't, they didn't, they couldn't hold the market. So what happened? Bailey decided he was going to create a spectacular street parade and ordered 12 new circus wagons for that street parade. We have uh, eight of them in the collection. One of them built in, uh, they were all built in 1903. Sort of the, the pinnacle of years of the spectacular street parade was probably uh, 1900 to 1906. So this was one of the 12 wagons he ordered. It probably uh, was the theme of the circus performance. In other words, what it was doing, what Shivery was doing was announcing that inside the tent, the spec, or what was shortly, it was called the spec, but really it was the spectacular is what it was really shortened for, what had to do with knights in shining armor and, and ladies and so forth. And this, this parade wagon sort of announced the theme of the inside. Uh, it is unusual in the sense that it is only a parade wagon. Uh, the heads come off, the wings come off, the tail comes off, and gets stored inside every day. And I have taken those heads off, and they probably weigh about three 300 pounds a week. So every day they were put up there and taken down without any mechanization. All right, let's step in here. Where we have here, so we have number one of the 12 wagons ordered by James Bailey. However, the Ringling Brothers got wind of the order and they ordered five new wagons themselves. This one is the, the uh, the Lion and Mirror was actually recon re reconditioned and looks like it looked for the Ringling Brothers Parade in 1903. Uh, it, the wagon was actually built in 1890 for the um, Adams Fourpaw Circus. The Ringling Brothers bought it and, and had it set up as their bandwagon, their number, their lead bandwagon. What that means is when this wagon was originally built, it had huge life-size life -size carvings of St. George slaying the dragon. The Ringling took those off and put seats for their lead band. Uh, the, big, the big shows often carried multiple bands, not just one. Uh, and so, number one bandwagon, this is uh, the Lion and Mirror. Now, for that, they did have new wagons built. The wagon in the corner, the white one, is called the Columbia Bandwagon. It was built in 1903, and its sister is sitting right here behind you, the United States Bandwagon. Same footprint. The difference between this wagon, these two wagons, is that one is original, and this is a copy. Um, the, the only thing that remained of this wagon and was found out in a, a field down in Indiana, it was, I mean, it was a circus company that had it, but they stopped using it uh, in uh, probably in the 1930s, and the wagon completely deteriorated. All we had when they started this restoration in 18, I mean, 1990, we had one of the men on horseback, we had one of the, the, the women angel figures, and a couple of the uh, full-size Indians, and everything else was redone. The difference between this wagon and the white wagon, this has a steel substructure, and we use it as our signature wagon as it travels around the country. It uh, has been in Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade 15 times. It'll be there again this year. Uh, it's pulled by Percheron horses. Percherons are the traditional circus draft horse. Um, however, circuses not only had Percherons, they also had Belgians and a few large workhorses that were really not draft animals, but uh, largely there were Percherons or Belgians. This is number two of the order from Mr. James Bailey in 1903. The America was um, a tableau wagon. What that means is it originally went up only to the blue line and there were life-size carvings on top. There were four of these wagons, America, Asia, Africa, and Europe built by Barnum, I mean by Bailey. We have this one and Asia, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Now, the reason we, uh, I want to talk about one thing that happens here at the museum. We have to decide when a wagon comes to us whether we, what period of time we take it back to. Because many of these tag wagons had many owners. It was a very, it was a very lively business in used circus parade wagons. After a circus would use them for a while, they would sell them. Somebody else would put it in their parade and so forth. In this particular case, um, 
When uh, Barnum stopped doing the street parade, this was sold to the Cole Brothers Circus. Uh, Cole Brothers, uh, in the late 1930s, needed a place for its Calliope. It's steam calliope, not calliope. Riverboat people called it a calliope. Uh, calliope. Circus people, people called it a, a calliope. Spelled the same way. somebody tending the steam because when this thing was it, when it's well well tuned it can be heard about a mile away it's a very very loud instrument on the other hand on the other side of number the white wagon here you'll see a little red wagon number 62 that is an air cali uh, at air calio it's played with a uh, usually has a, a small generator and and uh, uh, a vacuum cleaner pumps air into the, the machine and it plays, it's much quieter, of course. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, one question that I often get is, where did you get all these? Where did they come from? How? Well, they, they came to us in many different ways in the 1950s and 1960s. But believe it or not, these three right here from the Cole Brothers Circus were found only two years ago. And nobody knew they still existed. They were in a small uh, automobile museum in the back shop in Pennsylvania. And uh, with the help of the Kohler Foundation, we bought them, rehabilitated them here. Here's the third wagon that Mr. Bailey ordered. This was uh, the, the Asia, again, only up to the red, red line and the, the life-size figures. I said there were four, and Asia, Africa, Europe, and, and, and America. They all were the, of the same type. Uh, these, this one, bought by the Cole brothers, was again extended up because every parade wagon, every wagon, had to be used fully. It, in the, it, when it was um, on the street parading, it was probably empty. As soon as they would get back to the grounds, they would put, at the end of the night, chairs and tables and light fixtures and, and uh, costume trunks and all sorts of things. And every one of the wagons had exactly the same purpose every single day. You'll notice numbers on them, and that comes from the system of how they loaded them. Uh, there was a specific train loading order. It happened exactly the same way each time. And there were someone who called number 71, number 62, and then the teamsters were lined up at the base and would get that wagon in place and pulled up on top of the train car. Uh, the circus developed the uh, method of loading and unloading the train in a very efficient way. It was a commonly string of six to eight flat cars. They would bridge what, what they called uh, crossover plates. And so you could pull the wagon up from one end onto the top with a uh, a horse, a, a team of horses, changed the teams from the pull-up team to the pull-over team, and the pull-over team would pull it all the way down to its spot, uh, eight, six or eight cars down. They would lock, chuck it in place, and it'd be ready to roll. Uh, it was the beginning of the railroad, uh, the, the piggyback uh, railroad system of trucks on trains that uh, really got its start in the circus. All right, um, we'll stand right here. Uh, look, I'll tell you something. I told you that the golden age of the circus parade was really 1900 to 1906. Uh, now, some uh, circuses continued to parade on into the 1930s, but uh, an event took place in 1906 that changed everything. That's when James Bailey died, and the Ringling Brothers bought Barnum and Bailey. 
they did not run. They did not merge them. That uh, the one brother, one of the Ringling brothers, of which there were six. Uh, uh, they one ran Ringling brothers, and then another two brothers ran Barnum and Bailey. Uh, so they ran them separately until 1918. 1918, a very significant year in it relates to the circus. One, the, the Ringley brothers and the Barnum and Bailey separately were having trouble getting r- railroad power during World War One. So they decided to combine the two shows. Um, and on the way back to Baraboo, one of the the third brother, there were. By this time in 1918, there were only three brothers still alive. Um, And one of the brothers died on the way back to Baraboo. And uh, that left only two. And the two brothers that were left, Charles and John, were not particularly fans of Baraboo and rerouted the train to Bridgeport, Connecticut. And that was the winter quarters of Barnum and Bailey. And uh, basically, 1918, the train left Baraboo in the spring and never returned. And the people didn't know it was not going to return. Uh, so they were not a very popular family because the three brothers who were really the leading citizens of Baraboo had all passed away by that time. 1918, significant for another reason, and that is that the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey stopped doing the daily street parade. They were so big that um, by this time they were carrying 1,200 people, 380 draft horses to move the surface. Uh, they traveled on four sections of a train that numbered 100 railroad cars. Uh, and so, I mean, they were a gigantic operation. In fact, uh, they were Army officers in 1913 uh, are pictured studying how the circus did logistics uh, because they were moving all the people from day one day to the next to the next to the next. The only time the circus, the big circus, stayed in any place very long was New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, Boston, and Chicago, believe it or not. And not even Pittsburgh and Cleveland were big enough to hold them more than a day or two. Most of the time there were one night stands, but except for the very large cities. 1918 also, they stopped doing the street parade for a different reason. You see these wheels? They did not do very good things to warm asphalt on warm summer days. And so streets were getting paved. In addition, they were too tall for the electric lines and the telephone lines. In fact, we have pictures of men standing with pitchforks on this parade wagon going down the street raising the wires so that you didn't electrocute the band. Uh, uh, so 1918, we saw the street parade of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey stop. We saw the end of the Ringling Circus in Baraboo. We saw the uh, basic of the beginning of the move of the circus from both Bridgeport and um, and Baraboo to Florida. Anyone been to the Sarasota Museum, bring the museum in Sarasota? Okay, that was the result of John and Charles' desire to be land speculators. They bought 500,000 acres around Sarasota Bay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Ringling, um, the history, let's go on through this at uh, this moment. So the brothers, the, the reason the estate is where it is, is that was the estate of the two existing brothers, Charles and John, both had mansions where the museum is today. Now the art museum was really the art, private art collection of John and Mabel, the youngest son, and there is now a fairly small but growing uh, circus um, interpretive section. Uh, I think they have eight or ten wagons. Now, what happened to the Ringlings? Um, in addition to uh, the, the, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, which I've talked a lot about, there was another very significant competitor in the circus business called the American Circus Corporation. They owned, let's walk up here and you see a couple of their wagons. They were the main competitors with the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey in the 1920s. They owned a number of titles. They owned the Algae Barn Circus, number 181. Algae Barns was a circus in California, a West Coast circus. They owned the, uh, this number 19, sells logo, and title. So they owned a number of things, but and they were a major irritation to Brother John Ringling. So in April of 1929, he walked very bad he had six huge circuses on the road in 1929 and only two by 1932. He lost control of the circus to the banks. Uh, however, his two nephews, 
uh, John Ringer North and Charles something North, uh, bought the circus back in 1938, ran it from 1938 to 1956, uh, when it was sold to the Fell family of, of Vienna, Virginia. Uh, the Fell family will be celebrating in about a couple of years the 50th anniversary of what they call preservation of the brand. They have owned the brand. It is one of the best known brands in the world, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. They, they still, you may know, have two circuses out on the road, at least one is called the blue unit, one is called the red unit at any one time. But they don't they don't show in tents. They only show in, in uh, amphitheaters and auditoriums and so forth today. Uh, here we're standing with the great Gavioli band organ, which I'll play some circus music for you. And I mentioned earlier, baggage wagons. Here's the first baggage wagon. It happens to have the Benzini brothers' name on it from the uh, Waterford, Waterford Elephants. Yeah, yeah. So some people say, well, where, you know, how did you get all this? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Like uh, this one right behind me. So the circus has been in the movies for a long time. Uh, in the 1930s, um, the circus was a very popular movie theme, and so movie the studios had a lot of these wagons. So this one came to us from Universal Studios, this one came from Walt Disney, and probably a total of 20 that we have came from various uh, movie, movie studios uh, into the collection. All right. You can see down this side, you see how they loaded the railroad cars. This is actually, uh, looks like a, a, a Ringling Brothers um, railroad flat car in the 1930s. You see the wheels, all the wheels are rubber by this time. Some of them hard rubber and some pneumatic. This is a, a ticket wagon, the next is a, a giraffe wagon, and then the final is one of the early Zerbini human cannons. Doesn't look like much, but it's very significant to Barrow because Barrow has spawned two circuses. Not only the Ringling Brothers Circus, but also the Gomer Brothers Circus. Uh, we have three of the Gomer Brothers. This was a, they were cousins of the Ringlings. It was a small regional circus that really performed in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and really just pretty much here in the Midwest. Uh, there are two of their wagons across the river in uh, the, what we call the Baggage Horse Barn. This wagon behind you, uh, called the Swan Band Wagon, is very, very significant to Barrow for a different reason. And that most of the wagons, the fancy parade wagons, were made in New York City or Cincinnati. They were not made here. This one was. This one was created by the Moeller Brothers. The Moeller Brothers were the primary wagon builder for the Ringlings. They built all their baggage wagons, but they built two uh, spectacular parade wagons. The first one, if any of you have been across the river into in the building we call the Elephant House, you'll saw the bell, the bell wagon. Uh, it was created as the first wagon. Uh, and this one was uh, this one called the Swan Batten Wagon. It's in bad need of repair. It hasn't been in a parade in a long time. Uh, we estimate about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to get that wagon looking like it looked in in uh, 1903 when it paraded for the Ringling Brothers. Now. Uh, as I said earlier, we have to we take wagons back to a very specific point in time since they had many different owners, many different color schemes, and 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 so forth. And uh, but we we try as much as we possibly can to keep these wagons ready for a parade at a moment's notice. As I said, for years and years they went to Milwaukee. Uh, they we paraded 12 of them here in Baraboo a couple of weeks ago or in mid July. Uh, and it's it's a you know that you say well that's nice so why is that significant well first and foremost these wheels uh, are wooden they dry out uh, and when we did we did a, a, the last great circus parade in Milwaukee was done in 2009 uh, we had to redo 160 wheels they had to be taken off. They were shipped to Indiana to the Amish, who squeezed the steel back onto the the wooden, uh, and and you know, and that's they're the only place. It's it's a very specialized business, I'll tell you. You know, you don't have a lot of need for squeezing steel wheels back on wooden wheels. Um, so that's what we have here. Let's walk on back. These two wagon, these three wagons, uh, were part of. It's a, 
I would say, the prize gems of our entire collection. Uh, in 1880, P.T. Barnum felt there should be something in the street parade for children. So he ordered seven pony floats. And they depicted stories that children would know at that point in time. Mother Goose, Cinderella, Old Woman in the Shoe. Um, we only have three. There are only three that remain anywhere. Uh, the other four, we don't know what happened to the carvings. And they've been lost, uh, lost over the years. This, they were gold-leafed, actually, by, for us in one of the great circus parades, but they, would have, they looked like they did look in the 1903 Barnum and Bailey Parade. They were gold-leafed at that point in time. By the way, the circus back in those years was not a very, it was not for children. Children were not really, in, didn't go to the circus in the 1880s and 1890s because it was considered too risque. Women wore tights, uh, and it was not appropriate for children to see this. Uh, and it was also, you have to understand, the circus was about innovation. Uh, many, many, many people in America saw their first electric lights at the circus. They saw their first automobile, bicycle, motorcycle. It was about bringing innovation to, the, you know, to America, really. Uh, not only did we do the behind the scenes and figure out how to load trains and a lot of mechanization that went on with how do you put up tents and how do you take them down quickly and so forth. Uh, they were they were all about excitement and color and music. Uh, all of these things were in short supply in a rural America back 100 years ago. Uh, a little earlier, I made mention of the fact that one of the competing forms of entertainment was the Wild West show. This uh, Wells Fargo coach is one is an original from 1865. We have two of them. And uh, that's exactly right. We, we have another one that's not on display. And um, But a very significant form of entertainment for uh, the, these community, the communities was the Wild West show, which was cowboys and Indians and trick roping and shooting and so forth. It was an arena type show rather than a tented show. So we have a number of Wild West show wagons. This behind us is a Wild West show wagon from the Pawnee Bill Wild West show, considered by many people to be uh, one of the finest wood car examples of circus wood carving, even though it's on a, a, a Wild West show wagon. This is Columbus Discovery. America on this side and the other side uh, Pocahontas saving John Smith. Now looking across over here on the right hand side you can say well now this looks different. Um, in fact it is different. It is a British circus wagon. It is not American. Uh, and you can see the, the difference in the look. Uh, the wheels are not as wide, partially because even in the 1880s when these were being used, more and more of the most of the streets in England were paved. These uh, this these wagons are the wheels are so huge, so they wouldn't pull apart when they were up to their uh, the hubs in mud. Uh, in fact, there's a good, uh, on this wagon, just to show you an example, you know, every one of the wagons not only has a slot for the tongue, or what we call the pole, it has two rings. And what you could do here is if they, this wagon was stuck in the mud, they would hook uh, one team of eight here. They would also put a team of eight here and a team of eight on the other side, and an elephant would be behind with a big, strong helmet pushing. That's how they moved it out of the mud. It was really, I think, really the end of the year, extremely heavy. Now, let me talk a little bit about, uh, I said that Coach is our oldest American-made uh, wagon. This wagon, the Bostock Wombo Menagerie Bandwagon, is British. It dates from 1850. Uh, it is a band carriage, a wheel six feet high. Uh, it, it says Bostock, Bostock Wombwell Menagerie. And that gives me a chance to tell you that uh, in addition to giving a free street parade, as part of your ticket price to go to the circus, you got a zoo called a menagerie. Now, the menagerie in the early part of the 19th century was a separate business. People would go from town to town with an elephant or a giraffe or this or that or the other and charge people to see it. Well, then they aggregated into a little larger 
uh, aggregation of animals, and they called themselves a menagerie. But the menagerie sort of fell out of favor. And by 1850, menageries had been sort of assumed uh, as part of the circus. So what happened when you went onto the circus grounds? First came to the sideshow, where you saw the fire swallower and the fat lady and the bearded man and you know bearded lady and fat man or whatever, uh, and, and that was a separate ticket. But once you bought your main ticket, you got to go into the big. Uh, the first tent you went into was the menagerie. It was the zoo, and that's why many of these animals, all they did was uh, ride along, eat, and do whatever else they did. Yeah. Um, now, this wagon right here, the, the Gladiator, British, and um, different than American circus, the British circuses never traveled by river. Br bridges were too low, so they went overland. And this wagon, if it went overland, you'd say, well, my gosh, if it hit a bump, it'd fall over. Well, it doesn't because when it's traveling overland, they crank it down. It's called a telescoping pablo. It cranks down inside. So it goes down to 12 feet high, and then when it's fully extended, it's 18 feet high. You say, well, why does the Circus Museum in America have British circus wagons? That's a good question. Um, and let me tell you that story. Uh, in 1918, the British circuses that were still doing street parades at that point had to park their wagons because of, of the war. The British Army took all horses for the war, and the, this wagon was parked in a barn in central England on the estate of the Robert Fawcett Circus. Uh, the circus that had been, that family had been in the circus business in England for many hundreds of years. Um, so they were parked in this barn way back on this 600-acre estate. And during World War II now, this is now jumping ahead, 30 years, um, there was an American circus fan on a Sunday afternoon who found this barn. He knew generally where he was, but he, didn't, he wasn't looking for circus wagons. But he found this barn. The barn had fallen down on the wagons. Trees were growing up through the center of them. And uh, so he remembered that. And then when we were starting the museum here in 1959, he called the first director and said, during World War II, I saw some British circus wagon. Well, within a week, Chappie Fox, who was our first director, uh, had called the Fawcett family and gotten on a plane and went over and convinced them to give 18 British circus wagons to us. Now, they were in deplorable condition. It took several years uh, of re rehabbing these to make them look and usable uh, in the Great Circus Parade in Milwaukee. As I said, we make sure we try our very best to make sure that the wagons can be used at any time. And, and by the way, anybody got a million and a half bucks, we could do a Milwaukee parade or any town you want. That's what it, the last time we did the parade in Milwaukee, it cost a million and a half dollars. And it was all done, raised privately. There was no government money involved. In fact, there's no very, very, very little government money involved in our museum, even though we're owned. There's another telescoping tableau. Uh, which cranks down inside the top two layers come down. The Buffalo Bill ticket wagon is the only surviving wagon from the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. Uh, when we found this wagon, it was being used as a chicken coop down in Central Illinois. Um, now this little green wagon here on the, this side is different in the sense that it is goldy, but it's the only known Irish circus wagon. I think it was about 20 years ago, and uh, it, was a, it was a band carriage used by uh, the Hannaford Circus. The Hannaford name is still a very prominent circus name. It's been around for over 600 years in the circus business. Over here on this side is one of the, uh, the 12 wagons from the James Bailey collection. It was the, it was the snake in. And we'll stay provided there that 1903. All right, one more stop. There's a couple of about this number 23. Remember I said that the circus really wasn't for children, but there were some pretty smart entrepreneurs who said, well, children need entertainment too. So they created dog and pony shows. Uh -huh. And that's a wagon from a dog and pony show. Uh, it, it was really entertainment for mothers and children, usually the performers were dogs or ponies, uh, and, and it was done as an afternoon show. There's one there and there's one back there. They did a little parade and everything like that. Now, behind you, you see... Uh, 
the largest band wagon ever built. It was built for the James, uh, James by James A. for James A. Bailey Circus Parade in 1903. It is the two hemispheres band wagon. It weighs 13,200 pounds. Um, now, if you think about those early wagons I showed you from the collection, the America, the Asia. So in the parade, you would first have Mr. Bailey's number one band wagon. And it was usually pulled by 40 horses. 40, four wide, four wide and 10 deep. And for many years in the Great Circus Parade in Milwaukee, we had a 40 horse team on this wagon, pulled by a gentleman named Dick Sparrow, who just passed away last year. Uh, it, it, he, he didn't have reins on all the horses. He had reins on the front two, a team about midway back, and then the two teams right closest to the wagon. Uh, and he, his, I, I, my hand's not very small, but you reached his hand and you, it, your dis, hand disappeared. It's, uh, his hands were huge. Uh, and he controlled, he did that 40 horse team for um, almost 25 years. His son then picked it up. It doesn't exist anymore, but uh, it, this was unbelievable. But now, you see, this is two hemispheres. And right behind this in the 1903 parade would have been the four America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. What he was trying to do was to say, we are an international service. We have been around the world. And these upstart boys from Baraboo, they haven't been any place. <laughs> so that's, you, know, you can get an idea of what he was trying to do, at least with part of the parade. Had parade. Um, here's another, even earlier version of a Zerbini human cannon. Uh, that would you know, shoot a performer across the uh, tent. So that really pretty much wraps up uh, the tour. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm going to walk back up to the Gavioli band organ and play some more circus music, if anyone would like that. I want to say, I, I'm going to play for you the music from another very famous circus movie called The Greatest Show on Earth. This is the uh, um, 1955 Academy Award winning a movie uh, as the best movie of the year, uh, and because the music was fairly loud and goes for about eight minutes, uh, some of you will probably get tired of listening to it. Uh, so I'll say uh, thank you very much for joining me on the tour, and I'll be around for anybody who wants to uh, has any other questions. I'll also uh, I'll just tell you that the, the gavioli is an instrument that often was it was not usually put on a truck like this. Or, it would, usually would be sitting in a band, uh, uh, beer garden, and uh, there are still many of these around in Europe, not very many in the United States. Uh, I'm going to leave the back door open, and you can look inside if you'd like. You can't see very much, uh, but I, all I ask is that no more than about two of you go in at a time. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a spectacular instrument. It was not really a circus instrument, even though circuses carried these kind of instruments. In fact, we have one in the building across the way that was from a circus. Uh, this one actually, it was on the Royal American Carnival, not the circus. You were asking about Gibtown, and then, uh, so here we go with the greatest show on earth.